Why should you be interested in Lebanon? Firstly, uh, I think it's crucial for understanding the historical and current developments in the Middle East. Uh, and secondly, I find that Lebanon offers some historical validations for political theories in the tradition of Mary Rothbard and Hans Hermann Hoppe. The Lebanon originally is a mountain range, the Mount Lebanon, which offers some nice slopes for skiing. But this superficial similarity to Switzerland runs a bit deeper because living in the mountains has interesting cultural and political effects. It was Professor Hoppe himself who observed once that a difficult environment and climate fosters the development of intelligence, of hard work, and low time preference. And this pattern we can observe in Lebanon in the 18th century. A French visitor, Comte de Volney, observed uh, that those people that he found uh, in the Mount Lebanon were among the most hardworking uh, people that he has met in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, because what impressed him is that in order to cultivate the mountains, they had constructed terraces. They had carved out terraces in the mountains. And on one hillside, he counted 120 steps from the valley bottom to the summit. And he was quite impressed by this amount of intergenerational work, which of course is an indicator of a very low uh, time preference. Um, but he thought that hard work alone can't explain that. Living in the mountains must have another advantage. And by looking around, he found this advantage. Uh, it's a relative safety from state intervention. Mountains have always been a refuge and are much harder to control than the plains, which are in the open. Uh, so from early beginnings on, the people living in the regions uh, were very independent-minded, heavily armed, uh, and protecting their little thief domes uh, in the mountains. Already the most ancient people there, uh, one of the most interesting civilizations because it's one of the very few non-statist merchant civilizations, the Phoenicians uh, lived there. And later on, Maronite Christians among the first original Oriental Christians still speaking the language of Jesus, moved uh, to the mountains and established one of the earliest and most important monastic traditions. And a little bit later, the Druze, a um, sect considered by most Muslims as heretic, found refuge in the mountains as well. A hundred years after Volney, another Frenchman uh, visited the area and he confirmed uh, this observation. And Lamartine, his name was Lamartine, well known French uh, literate, uh, and uh, he found uh, that uh, the Maronite Christians that he visited were among the happiest people that he had ever met. Uh, and uh, he was the first one to compare them to Switzerland. Already in the, it was in the 19th century. And he said, I quote him literally, even Switzerland does not afford more of an image of liveliness, happiness, and peace than the Mount Lebanon. And he tried to find out the reasons for this relative happiness and peace. And the reasons he, give are quite inter he gives are quite interesting. At first, uh, he says uh, they are self-governed to an extent that they are not afraid of the state, but the state is afraid of them. Secondly, property is secure and inheritable. Thirdly, trade is very vivid, lively. The commercial activity uh, is very strong. And uh, all these uh, factors, and uh, fourthly, uh, sorry, the laws that they follow, the common laws that they follow, are very simple and pure. Uh, so all those are uh, institutional explanations that might not surprise you. Uh, but the question is, uh, with Lebanon still being one of the freest economies in the region, how come it's not compared to Switzerland anymore? Why hasn't it become the utopia we would expect, uh, or maybe you would expect it to become? Uh, and uh, to retrace uh, this history and how they deviated from the Swiss path uh, gives us a lot of explanations about this intermix of geopolitics, local politics, and ethno-religious issues we are, which are at the core of the upheaval that we see in the world nowadays. Um, 
The Christians uh, settling in the mountains were rediscovered by Europeans in the Renaissance. They were quite surprised to find still a uh, vivid uh, Christian tradition with monasteries and high uh, cultural uh, standards uh, living in these uh, secluded mountains. And since then, there has been a link between uh, uh, Europe in particular and the Maronite Christians, um, which uh, uh, increased their cultural level and contributions. They uh, created very early on a college in Rome. This link to the West, of course, in a way, uh, was an advantage for the Christian population and puts the Druze at a certain disadvantage, which they compensated by becoming closer to the Ottoman uh, rulers, which who had persecuted them before. And uh, they could carve out their own independence by being full of lords. Through the link to Western culture, also some pernicious ideas slowly started mushrooming uh, among the Christians uh, in uh, Lebanon. Uh, among those ideas are in particular nationalism, democratism, and egalitarianism. And all those three ideas have at the core a truth but are turned into falsehoods by ideological misunderstandings. Uh, and uh, the comparison to the Swiss path explains a lot about the effect uh, of those ideological misunderstandings. Um, in um, nationalism, nationalism uh, is quite different from cultural patriotism, uh, but at first it was conceived as such. The Christians uh, conceived uh, a form of Arab nationalism as a way uh, to protect the culture towards the Turkic uh, overlords um, and are among the most important contributors to Arab literature. Uh, very few Arab speakers nowadays have an idea how much they owe to those Maronite Christians and their impact on the language and literature was immense. Uh, Yet, uh, over time, uh, this, uh, national, this nationalism was exaggerated politically. Um, what happened uh, is that uh, we had a constellation of local politics and geopolitics intermingling. Uh, among the truths, uh, a lord found out, something that has been found out by rulers throughout history, that he could protect his rule by getting rid of the nobility and enlarge population under his control. And how did he do it? He converted to Christianity and suddenly he had uh, many more subjects so he could use to get rid of the local Druze nobility. Uh, of course, the Druze didn't take uh, that lightly and the Druze population uh, took revenge uh, with uh, massacres amongst the Christians, which further away in Damascus were interpreted as, interpreted as uh, a, a war, a civil war between Muslims and Christians. The Christians uh, joined this lord in a rebellion against the feudal lords because it was part of a social revolt. It was part of an egalitarian approach to society. But the problem is in Damascus, the social classes were quite the opposite. The wealthy were the Christians, and the poor was the sunny majority population who took uh, to a massacre before the Christians would butcher them. Um, uh, Lebanon since then has been a very important study field for the social dynamics of massacres, unfortunately, and it has never been as easy as Muslims butchering Christians. Muslims were butchering, butchering Christians, but the dynamics are much more complicated uh, than that. And usually it's an intermix of local politics and geopolitics, uh, which turns certain populations against each other, and then the religious affiliation becomes uh, a label which can easy, easily attribute it to uh, some foreign influence. Um, the French protected the Maronites, and at the same time, the French took an interest in Arab nationalism because they wanted to carve out a sphere, sphere of influence in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, so they supported Muhammad Ali uh, for his project of carving out an Arab nation state. The third first Arab nation state in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, of course, that had little to do with Arabism, it's just politics. Muhammad Ali himself was not an Arab, he was an Albanian, uh, but he used this political force and he used the support he got by the French. And at first the Christians uh, and this uh, former Druze uh, lord, uh, whose name was Bashir Shahab, uh, allied themselves 
with Muhammad Ali. And Muhammad Ali started the first project of modernizing and creating a modern nation state. And once the Christian population realized what it means, fortunately, they rebelled and got rid of Muhammad Ali. Because what does modern nationalism mean in contrast to a kind of cultural patriotism? Modern nationalism means regular taxation, conscription, government intervention, education, and most importantly, disarming the local population. And that uh, has always been the pattern of this kind of mis ideological misunderstanding of nationalism, creating a homogeneous centralized state uh, against the population by changing, re-educating, homogenizing the population. And fortunately, this first project was put to a halt. Uh, and uh, the French carved out a smaller version, which was still called Greater Lebanon. One of the pernicious effects of nationalism is this idea of greatness. The larger the area, the more powerful the region, which in this case was very dangerous in combination with another pernicious idea coming from the West, this democratism, which has very little to do with the tradition, the tradition of democracy as we see it in Switzerland uh, and even in the ancients, among the ancients. Uh, in, Swiss, in Switzerland, democracy uh, means the self-government of small, decentralized communities. And the political activity is mainly an educational endeavor to bring out the best in the citizens, namely jointly protect the commons without any professional politicians or rulers needed. Now, the modern idea of democratism is quite the opposite. Uh, it means party lines, it means elections, and it means numbers. And it should rather be called majoritarianism. And whenever we have a heterogeneous population and we introduce the idea of majoritarianism, two new political winning strategies arise. And their incentives are terrible. Those two winning strategies are outbreeding and genocide. Whenever we have majoritarianism. And what happened in uh, great, Greater Lebanon, which was not restricted to the Mount Lebanon, but added uh, areas in the south, east, and north of Mount Lebanon, while Mount Lebanon uh, was dominated by the Maronite Christians demographically, those other regions have a majority Sunni and Shia Muslim population. And of course, once the idea of majoritarianism is mushrooming, conflicts will arise sooner or later. Uh, and the major conflict that should arise was nationalism turning against its original instigators, the Christians. Uh, the Arab Christians were among the first Arab nationalists, uh, uh, but they should pay a heavy price uh, for that because uh, later on there was a short-lived union by Syria and Egypt uh, which turned Muslims all around the world quite enthusiastic because uh, uh, they already got hold of the idea of nationalism and thought that's the chance to establish a majoritarian Islamic state with all its power and splendor uh, and whatever efficient and uh, strong state can create the land of plenty that uh, they are promised uh, by uh, Western intellectuals uh, usually. Now, by the accidents of geopolitics, uh, this union was not part of the US-led axis of power, but fell to the other side in the Cold War. So, joining in this union would have meant breaking any links with the Western powers that were the protectors of the Maronite Christians. So, the Maronite Christians felt a conflict of interest and would not be as happy as the Muslims joining this new union, uh, which led to slight protests uh, by Muslims who didn't feel represented in government uh, uh, as uh, it should be. And then a Christian politician, President Hamoun, asked for foreign intervention because he wanted to extend his term of power and he felt threatened by this upheaval in majoritarian democracy and one power answered positively, and that was a crucial turning point uh, for history. In 1958, uh, the United States invaded Lebanon, the Operation Blue Band. Uh, 
<coughs> Already this very first intervention was based on a lie. It was based on a lie that according to the Eisenhower doctrine, uh, it was an intervention to prevent a state from being taken over by a communist army. But when the clueless Americans landed in Lebanon, there was no communist army anywhere. There wasn't even war, uh, uh, but they were cheered uh, by the local population. So America took some very wrong lessons out of this first adventure. adventure. First, the local population cheered when they arrived. Second, there was almost no death toll. Two Americans drowned while swimming. That was it more or less. Uh, thirdly, they installed a new president, uh, General Fuad Shahab, who is a descendant of the Bashir that I had mentioned before. And he undertook the great project of making Lebanon safe for democracy without much help from the US needed. Uh, so for the United States, it seemed like intervention is easy and fun. Uh, it was like after a week that they seemed victorious. What they didn't know, of course, is that the people that cheered for them uh, just thought that those are GIs taking a break from an exercise and coming as tourists. So good businessmen that they are, they sell all the dollars coming in and were quite happy and cheerful because they had no idea there was no war going on, no army there, so why are all, the, all those Americans coming on the beach? And certainly to have a nice time on the beach. Uh, and uh, what uh, they uh, wouldn't figure out is that this project of making Lebanon safe for democracy would wreak havoc on the country. What happened? Shahab, uh, started the second project of modernizing, centralizing the Lebanese state, creating a Lebanese identity. It was a process of homogenization of the population, of centralization, of urbanization, of secularization, uh, which for a while seemed to work. The conflict seemed to disappear into a new urban intelligentsia, students who didn't really belong to anything, uh, and it seemed safe for democracy. But what we discover again and again in history is that once a traditional society turns very quickly into a modernized, centralized one, issues of identity, crisis of identity arise. And it was a particular among these newly urbanized young intelligentsia that the lust for war increased. The same thing happened before the First World War uh, in Europe. It was particular among those homogenized, uh, apparently safe voters for democracy that the lust for war increased uh, once the challenge was there. And the challenge arrived when a mass immigration of Palestinians started, uh, which tilted the demographic balance even more uh, towards uh, Muslim majority. And at the same time, there was another foreign intervention. Israel tried to win over the Christians as their allies because they thought Logically, that's a Christian population engulfed by Muslim majority. They should be willing to be allies of Israel, but they were surprised that most Christians were anti-Zionists. Why? Why were they anti-Zionists? Because they thought that setting up a nation state with an exclusive minority would upset the whole region. And at the end, the Christians would have to pay the price, which was quite far seeing uh, the population back then, but then all the vicious circles started that we have become used to in the Middle East. False flag operations, assassinations, and massacres got started. And of course, once this vicious circle is going, you have this intermix of ethno-religious issues, micro-political issues, which are just about local power bases and geopolitics, where potential parts of the population are seen as enemies that are threatening your existence if you're belonging to the, the other religion, the other tribe. So there was even killings and massacres among Christians uh, with differing tribes, differing affiliations. Uh, some Christians in the end allied with Israel. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, 
uh, confirmed all the worst uh, expectations of uh, Muslims uh, that the Christian would turn against uh, their neighbors uh, in hand in hand with a foreign uh, uh, occupying power. Uh, that was the Lebanese Civil War that waged starting 1975. So the conflict in 58 was just uh, uh, you pacified it a little bit but it just flared up much more intensely later on, a pattern we see in American intervention uh, ever and ever again repeating. Uh, what's the effect of war? Not only material destruction, and this least important effect of war, uh, Lebanon, uh, for not having a functional and efficient state, has always been a rather laissez-faire environment. And it is quite amazing what businessmen can achieve in a short while. Uh, um, already Volney, the first observer, when he visited the region, he said, I am deeply moved by how powerful the slightest breeze of freedom seems to be. The effect the slightest breeze of freedom has. So it's amazing how quickly the country has always been rebuilt after the destructions. But the cultural destruction you can't offset. And one of the most important impacts of war is that it raises time preference. It raises time preference and uh, also indirectly because due to the emigration because of war you have remittances and remittances uh, have the same effect as development aid. That's a kind of private development aid. Uh, it's not for the good. Uh, development aid leads in general, if it's private or governmental, to an increase of time preference in the local population. And this increase in time preference now cannot be upset anymore by the difficult environment. Why? Because due to technology and international trade, this reasoning doesn't work anymore. Living in mountains doesn't mean you have to be a hard-working subsistence farmer anymore. You just get into the car and drive to the next uh, department store uh, to get uh, your food stuff. So this destructive effect of war is not offset by another cultural effect or would take a long time. So what we could observe in Lebanon is an increase of time preference. That means uh, it has become a very materialist and consumerist uh, society with very low saving rates. So even though we have a particularly free economic environment, uh, uh, the capital formation is not as large as we as we would hope to see it. So cultural factors are more important than most uh, economists uh, think. Uh, and this, of course, explains why it hasn't really become uh, this uh, utopia we should maybe expect. Uh, taxation is very light and largely evaded. Regulation is attenuated by corruption. Uh, but most uh, Lebanese intellectuals nowadays, by going through uh, Western-sponsored uh, uh, universities, have this idea and this explanation that Lebanon isn't Switzerland anymore because it lacks an efficient state and it has too much corruption and it's not safe for democracy. Uh, that's a very big understanding, a misunderstanding, which we can reveal by looking at the uh, Swiss history and how it deviated uh, from uh, this history. Now, uh, efficient government uh, we could see in Syria. That uh, was efficient uh, control of the population. Uh, and for a, a short while, people even looked towards uh, Syria in Lebanon uh, as an example, but that of course has disappeared completely. Uh, uh, so it's quite foolish in this region to expect something out of an efficient state. Uh, uh, and uh, the interpretation of corruption is the same error. So what they see by looking at the Swiss population, the Swiss Switzerland right now, they see an orderly, clean, not corrupt society, but they misunderstand two phenomena. The one is the private corruption, which is just an expression of low trust. Uh, and Swiss, uh, Switzerland is not a corrupt society in the sense that the trust is still relatively high among the population. You just don't drop your garbage because you know that no one else would do it. Whereas in a country where trust has been destroyed, you drop your garbage because everyone is doing it, so it doesn't make a difference if you uh, drop your garbage. Uh, so this 
type of corruption is totally different from the type of corruption which is just uh, not playing along the formal rules uh, uh, of the state. Uh, and corruption in this sense has a positive impact because it attenuates the effects of regulation and it attenuates the potential foreign intervention into the country, Le into Lebanon, a lot of money from Iran, from the US, from Saudi Arabia is flowing. If it wasn't for corruption, the impact would be much worse. Uh, so corruption drowns resources that are also resources that are used for the bad. Uh, corruption breaks rules that you can't really live by, of course, in a, uh, uh, in a system that gives you little uh, uh, security you can't follow the same regulations uh, as you do in a high trust, uh, a high security environment as in Switzerland. All well, the productivity is, of course, a bit, well, it's the regulation is a bit offset by the productivity and uh, stability that you might have. Uh, whereas uh, in Lebanon or other uh, oriental countries, if you just follow the example of the West, you uh, uh, certainly won't go anywhere. So I think if we look at Lebanon nowadays, after these pernicious wars in a very small area, having nowadays the largest population of refugees per capita, a quarter of the population almost, which means uh, multiply the millions that you have in Turkey by 12, uh, that would be about the amount of refugees they house, this immense destruction going on and still it is amazing, and I'm always amazed uh, what a success story it has been. Uh, we don't uh, read much about uh, it. hasn't been drawn fully into the civil war in Syria, just at the borders, because it's not because uh, government was, was that efficient, because it's not functional enough to have a non-neutral position. And once you have a non-neutral position in geopolitics and potential mass immigration, which might take a strong geopolitical stance, of course, you have all the geopolitical conflicts within your country, uh, and it's the most difficult situation any region can have that Lebanon is experiencing. I still think it's a success story uh, in the end for where it's not deviated from the Swiss path of neutrality, of uh, self-government of small communities, of resistance to homogenization and centralization and building up of a functional modern state at the price of traditional structures. But it's not a shining success story. But then I think in the distorted world of today, if you have a shining example or a shining city on the hill, it most certainly has a rotten and evil core. Thank you for your patience.